Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash The Rob Burgess Show. Over 250,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Hello and welcome to the Rob Burgess Show. I am, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 27th episode, our guest is Ash Burgess. But before we get to that, I need to take a moment to tell you about our sponsor. For you, the listeners of the Rob Burgess Show podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. A book which pertains to this episode is The Illustrated Man by Ray Bradbury. Whatever book you pick, you can exchange it at any time. You can cancel at any time, and the books are yours to keep. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash The Rob Burgess Show. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash The Rob Burgess Show for your free audiobook. Also, please make sure to comment, follow, like, subscribe, share, rate, and review everywhere the podcast is available. Whether it's iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Facebook, Twitter, Internet Archive, TuneIn, or RSS. You can find links to everything on the official website, www.therobburgessshow.com. You can also find out more about me by visiting my website, www.thisburgess.com. Back to today's show. You first heard Ash Burgess on episode 16 and episode 26 of the podcast. Ash Burgess has a dusty degree in religious studies, an obsession with pineapples, and an appetite for both high and low culture. She cuts her own hair, bakes her own sourdough bread, and spends most of her time at home with her young son. Sometimes she blogs at burgessbaby.blogspot.com. And now, on to the show. All right, so welcome back to the Rob Burgess Show, Ash Burgess. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. Um, So, uh, after I finished recording our last episode, you uh, texted me in a panic saying that you had uh, forgotten some very, very important uh, details about the fall season. I wouldn't say it was a panic exactly, so much as just that I felt it was very important I point out to you that we really only touched on certain subjects and pretty much blown past some very important issues that we need to discuss about the fall. Okay. Um, mostly food related, I feel like, mm-hmm. but also the fashion. Well, that's important too. Uh, where would you like to start? I think we should start with pumpkin spice. Okay. Uh, give us an overview of what pumpkin spice is, just to start with. I mean, pumpkin spice is a flavor. It's basically cinnamon, nutmeg, I think probably either cloves and or allspice and ginger in some sort of combination. I don't know the exact ratios that make up pumpkin spice. But as I'm sure everyone is aware, pumpkin spice has become kind of a thing, like a very, very popular fall thing. I mean, I'm sure that the flavor combination of pumpkin spice has always been popular, but I feel like now it's like gone to the point where there's fan merchandise. Like you can get like coffee mugs and t-shirts and things that just say pumpkin spice. And to me, that's always a sign that something has gone past just, oh, people like this to like people are fans of this flavor. It's like people are really wild about it. And it's definitely become a symbol of the fall. Mm-hmm. So when, when's the earliest you start seeing the pumpkin spice in the stores and things? I feel like I started seeing it a few weeks ago. Um, I know Starbucks just maybe around the Labor Day weekend-ish is when they released their pumpkin spice latte. And I believe that th- that latte is a big part of the whole thing that I'm talking about as far as people that are crazy about pumpkin spice. The pumpkin spice latte is a huge deal. Mm-hmm. And, of course, I worked at Starbucks for three years, so mm-hmm. I'm well acquainted with just the level of passion people have about pumpkin spice. I wasn't really aware of how into pumpkin spice people are until I was working there and seeing how people would come in 
and just every day be asking when will the pumpkin spice be out <laughs> and it's it's like a big deal right right um now do you think that the pumpkin spice phenomenon has jumped the shark yet as in like you think it's overdone do you think it's in too many products? Because I feel like there's new products every year that, that have the pumpkin spice that didn't put either before. So. Yes. I mean, I'm definitely seeing all kinds of things in the stores, you know, pumpkin spice Oreos and pumpkin spice flavored popcorn and just all kinds of pumpkin spice things. And I haven't tried a lot of those, so some of them are probably delicious and I don't know. Mm-hmm. But I definitely think that there's too much. It's kind of like sriracha. Like, mm-hmm. suddenly... Everything in the snack aisle is sriracha flavored, and it's like there's too much. Yeah. I think pumpkin spice has kind of gone that same way. Like people are really into it, and people will buy it, but like some things don't need to be pumpkin spice flavored. Um, I will say I'm amused though, so I, I enjoy just seeing. I really like when I see a really strange product, and I wish I had a great example for you right now, but just mm-hmm. a weird product that's like this should not be pumpkin spice flavored, but it is. Mm-hmm. That's what I like to see. I did try. Um, Pumpkin Spice M&M's once a few years ago, and mm. I was not a fan. I honestly thought that they were, like, truly, truly terrible. Mm. But um, going back to the lattes, I did actually do a little bit of homework, and I went out and got some Pumpkin Spice coffee in preparation for this episode. Well, somebody went to the store and got it for you. Okay, but so... I... <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. I waited in the car with our child while you ran into the store to get the Pumpkin Spice coffee. Equally important jobs. Yes. But... Anyway, <laughs> I've sampled the flavors of the season in preparation for yes. your podcast. Yes. Um, I don't actually like lattes, so I just got the pumpkin spice in my coffee. But mm-hmm. anyway, I'm not a huge fan. I mean, I don't think it's bad. I like it, but I don't think I had one last year, and I probably won't have another one this year. So probably once every couple of years, I'll have something with pumpkin spice just to kind of taste the flavor, but... I like it more just in something like a baked good. Like, for example, right now as we speak, I'm making some pumpkin muffins, and I put some pumpkin spice in there. Mm -hmm. And that's really enough for me. I don't really need other things to be flavored like pumpkin spice. And I think that when I first tasted the pumpkin spice at Starbucks, I was honestly a little disappointed because it's not as pumpkin-y as I would want it to be. And in some ways, that's probably for the best, Mm -hmm. because I'm not really that into artificial flavors, and I probably like that it's mostly just based in actual spices and not some kind of strange pumpkin flavor. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think pumpkin spice kind of, while yes, I think technically it is just the spices, it sort of implies that there will be more of a pumpkininess to it. And I'm a huge pumpkin fan. Mm -hmm. Like, we are always trying different um, pumpkin beers this time of year. Mm -hmm. And I'm always looking for one that has a good balance of the pumpkin and the spices. I don't like when it's just all spice. And I don't like when it just tastes like mostly pumpkin and not enough spices. It's a really delicate balance, and I haven't found... I don't think I've found the perfect pumpkin beer yet. Mm -hmm. Actually, when I was cleaning out the back closet at our house, I actually just found the diary we kept. We may have to update that this year. Yeah, we should definitely... Do you remember what the best one we thought was? I forget what we crowned the king of, of the pumpkin beers. I don't know. We'll have to really revisit that and see. Because, I mean, there's probably been even more entries into the pumpkin beer category since the last time we looked, because I think it's another I think, thing that's... I think, like pumpkin spice, it's just one of those things on. that's just blowing up. People are crazy yeah. about it, and, I mean... But that's not pumpkin spice. That's just pumpkin flavor, because, like, as I you... think it often includes pumpkin spice, though. Because that's what I'm saying is that sometimes it tastes to me like it's just spices and beer, mm. and sometimes it's it's a balance between there's got to be a pumpkin flavor and a spice flavor in exactly the right balance for me to think it's, like, really good. But you were telling me that pumpkin spice doesn't actually contain pumpkin, it's just the spices you would put with a pumpkin, right? I wouldn't say 100% on that, because I was always a little bit too afraid to look at the ingredients <laughs> on, like, if we're talking about, are we talking about pumpkin spice, just the spice, or are we talking about the pumpkin spice latte? Uh, well, you said you don't drink the lattes, right? No, but I mean, you know, the syrup that you would use to make the latte, right. like the Starbucks, Starbucks pumpkin spice flavor. Right. I don't know what's in there. Mm-hmm. I worked at Starbucks for a long time. I had many opportunities to look at it, but sometimes it's better not to know. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and there's a lot, I will say there's a lot of ingredients. Like I've definitely handled the product enough to see that there's a list of ingredients and I don't know if it's changed between now and, you know, when I used to work there, but Mm -hmm. there's a lot going on and it's definitely a formula that people like that they've, Mm -hmm. you know, landed upon. And I wouldn't, I would never attempt to clone that flavor exactly inside my own home. Mm Mm-hmm. 
do you think that the formula that they use has changed at all? Like just based on what you not take, that I know it's, of. It's basically the same. Tastes the same to me. Okay. Now, what flavors do you think like complement pumpkin spice well? Like, what would you pair with it ideally? Besides, in, are you are you talking about in like are we still talking about like a Starbucks drink or are we talking you know on a wider? Well, I mean, it can be whatever, but I mean, it, it's kind of like what flavor profile I guess pumpkin would be a good match. Yeah, right? I mean, honestly, to me. I just don't need things to be flavored like pumpkin spice unless they're just like the muffins that I'm making have pumpkin spice as in like the mix of cinnamon and nutmeg and mm-hmm. ginger and all that in them. And that's to me enough. Like I don't need other things like M&Ms and Oreos to be pumpkin spice flavored. Yeah. Like I just want something that naturally uses those spices. Fair enough. <laughs> um <laughs> I mean, I feel like other people would disagree because uh, there just seem to be more and more combinations. But. Clearly, and I'm happy for people that want those flavors to appear in unusual places. I'm happy to see the flavor spreading because I'm sure it's, as much as I'm just delighted to see it, I'm sure it's even more exciting for someone that actually wants to eat those things. Sure, absolutely. Uh, was there anything else we didn't cover about pumpkin spice that you wanted to? I think that's about? pretty much it. I mean, it's just such an iconic flavor of the season that I thought, you know, we would be very remiss not to mention it. Yeah. Um, the other sort of iconic flavor, or I guess more in this case, it's a specific food of the season that I wanted to talk about is the candy corn. Oh, and yes. I did actually obtain, or to be factual, we were all at the store, and I put into our cart a bag of candy corns, because I know you like to be very factual about how the, oh, yeah. how the products were obtained <laughs> in preparation uh-huh. for the podcast. Absolutely. But anyway, we have um, some candy corns here that I thought we could sample to reacquaint ourselves with. But I also, rather than just getting a bag of candy corns, I opted to get the autumn mix because it also contains the Indian corn, which I don't know, and maybe we'll find this out when we taste these, I don't know if the Indian corn is actually a different flavor than the candy corn or if it's just colored differently. Like, is the brown tip of the Indian corn... Like chocolate, or is this just a candy corn of different colors? And then there's also those kind of weird pumpkins that are made of the candy corn material. And I've learned when I purchased these that these are apparently called the mallow cream pumpkin. Really? Yes. And I don't know if that's because they're supposed to taste like a marshmallow cream, or I don't know what's happening there. I guess we'll find out more. I don't think I've ever had the pumpkins before. I've had the candy corns before, and honestly... I've become more of a candy corn fan over the years as a symbol of the season. Like, Mm -hmm. I would probably be more likely to own a candy corn item, like a coffee mug with a picture of a candy corn on it or a little enamel candy corn Mm -hmm. pen than I would be to actually be found eating a candy corn. I was going to say, when you were a kid and you got some candy corn in your, your, uh, you know, bag of treats or whatever, how would you feel about that? Would it be a... Not great. Harper, what would you like to say about Halloween? Yes. Yes? Yes, we're recording a podcast. What do you want to tell everyone about Halloween? Yes. What are you going to be for Halloween? Are you going to be a doggy? What does the doggy say? Or a kitty? Would you like to be a kitty cat? Meow. Yeah, meow. What about a bat? What does the bat say? Oh, we don't know, do we? Yeah. I guess we haven't really encountered that many. So what you were saying is, um, how would I feel as a child yes. getting candy corn, like as the Halloween candy or something, mm-hmm. or right, you right. go to someone's house to like have some candy, and then mm-hmm. it's candy corn. Not great. Like. I definitely had a phase as a child where I was like, I hate candy corns, I don't like them, and nobody in my family was really into them either. Mm -hmm. Um, Then I remember a long period of time where, for some reason, I had decided that the little white tip tasted okay, and I'm not really clear why I decided this, because I honestly think that probably the whole candy corn tastes the same. It's all the same material, isn't it? I think so. I think it's just colored differently, you know, the you know, the yellow and the orange and the white stripes. But I definitely had a very long phase that I think probably extended all the way through high school 
where I would be like, oh, just the white tips taste okay, and I would, like, eat the tip off and throw the rest of the candy corn away. Mm-hmm. I assume now that that was more to do with, you know, when you're a kid and you're so invested in the idea of having favorites and things that are distinct to kind of define your personality, I'm sure that my delusion about the white tip tasting somehow better was somehow related to my thinking that I was, you know, a discerning individual who only liked certain parts. Yeah. But now I think I like them enough that, like, if I could just eat, like, one or two candy corns a year... That would be enough for me. <laughs> Sadly, I don't think they sell them in those small Just an individual candy days. corn packet? No, it's uh-huh. really disappointing because we actually bought some candy corns last year. Mm-hmm. You know, I think we bought them sometime before Halloween, and I, I bought them to make... I was trying to make some sort of Halloween bark mm-hmm. or something, and yeah. they I needed them for looks more than for taste. But anyway... Um, I remember when we moved in January, I threw the rest of the bag away because it had just been lingering in our cabinet that whole time. So obviously we're not huge candy corn eaters, and I definitely don't need things to be flavored like candy corns, which I've also noticed creeping into the store as like weird like candy corn flavored M&Ms and other candy corn flavored things that I'm just like, no, we don't need this. But I do appreciate the aesthetic. I mean, it's a pretty pleasing color combination. Just, you know, the orange, the yellow, the white. It's very iconic for the season. I like all that about it. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's a very, like, if I had to pick, like, an iconic, just for looks, food of the season, I think that that candy corns would definitely be, be it. I mean, it's hard to mistake the yellow, orange, white. Exactly, and I've seen all kinds of things on Pinterest where you can make, like, candy corn jello shots or candy corn waffles and i would totally do something like that just because of like the way it looks it would be so awesome right uh well where would you like to start sampling i think we should start with the traditional candy corn okay sample that and then we can kind of go from there do i have to eat the white tip first or i think i'm going to just just to see if it tastes different than the rest of it pretty much how i remember it yeah, I mean, it's just a very, very sweet... Mm-hmm. You know, here's something I wanted to talk about. I've noticed that there's a thing where some people eat, in combination, candy corns and peanuts. I Yeah, I didn't know that until you pointed it out to me. Well, I didn't really realize it before, but then I saw... Well, I've seen on Facebook, like, once or twice, someone like... I'm eating my candy corn and peanuts. I'm so excited. And I just thought, like, whatever, weirdo. You know, but then in the store, when I was buying these candy corns, the display that they had set up had candy corns, and then on a tier above them, it had a bunch of peanuts. Mm -hmm. So that makes me assume that this is, like, a thing that a lot of people are doing Mm -hmm. that I was just, you know, not aware of before. Like this kind of makes sense. Savory, sweet. It does, and I can I can see how Fresh if I was someone candy. who ate peanuts, I can see how that would probably taste good. Absolutely, I think that candy corns are supposed to be flavored with honey, and honey and peanuts are a thing. Like they go to what like honey roasted, mm-hmm. so that makes sense. Okay, now biting into the orange part, I do kind of think it tastes a little bit different. It's a little more intense of flavor, isn't mm-hmm. it? So I think, and also I noticed when I bit it, it was a very like clean bite off like there was a you like separated at the color pretty easily so maybe they are different flavors i don't know and see i said all these terrible things about my previous mm-hmm. you know thinking that they were different flavors and maybe i was right back then yeah i mean the yellow part now i think it's i think they're different i think that the orange part is the most intense mm-hmm. the yellow part almost seems the consistency is like denser mm-hmm the white part is also, I think, a little denser right. in consistency. And, like, a milder flavor. Mm-hmm. Huh. Maybe you are, right? Maybe. Uh, we have the brown and orange ones. I believe that is Indian corn. I don't know if... I mean, that's maybe not a very PC term. Although it is, I mean, you see, you know, the red or the brown corn. It's still referred to as Indian corn. And I don't think that's derogatory in any way. I just, I noticed that this was just in the autumn mix. I don't know if the bag by itself says Indian corn anymore or just something else. But anyway, yeah. let's find out if this brown tip is actually chocolate flavor. You know what the brown tip for it. Yeah. I think it is chocolate. Yeah, it definitely is. Definitely chocolate flavor. That's definitely what they were going for. Yeah. And then the orange part, I think, is just 
whatever the orange material is. Hmm. I don't get definitely chocolate, though, which that's good to know. But the orange isn't supposed to be an orange, is it? No, it's just whatever that sort of honey flavor is. Right. Now we are uh, trying the last one, which is the pumpkin, which we should say at the very tip of, at the top, has a uh, green part, which is not featured in any of the others. Well, I think the green is supposed to be it's a stem with some leaves, mm -hmm. which I appreciate because it definitely looks more like a pumpkin this way than if it was just kind of an orange yeah. plum. It'll be interesting to see... It'll be interesting to see if the orange part of this tastes the same as the orange on the other, which I'm assuming it will. Like if this is just a giant orange candy corn yeah. material thing. Also, I don't know if they're going for any kind of flavor for the green. I'm going to try the green first just to see. It tastes pretty plain to me. Yeah, it doesn't just really sweet. taste like much. Yeah, orange pretty much tastes like... I don't think so. No? What does it taste I like? I feel like it's a milder flavor than the orange of the candy corn. Mm. It's definitely a very, very similar. Like, I assume at the factory they're making this all in the same <laughs> vat or whatever. But it doesn't taste quite as strong to me. What do you think of this uh, shape for a candy corn? Is it too thick? It's a lot. I mean,. I feel a little bit jittery and weird just having eaten the candy corn and the Indian corn, and now I'm about halfway through this pumpkin, and I honestly am feeling a little ill. But <laughs> that's not a slam against the, the flavor. It's just I don't usually eat things that contain this much corn syrup, so it's just it's a lot. It's a lot to take in at once. Yeah, I'm sure people that drink Coke and, you know, have a lot more sugar than we do, or high fructose corn syrup probably won't feel the effects as much. So what else did we not uh, talk about last time? Dara, well, we... one more thing I want yeah, to say about sorry, the candy corn, and then we can move on yeah. to some other very important areas. Um, I always had the sort of thought that the candy corn shape was supposed to be, you know, a corn kernel. Uh-huh. But it's very pointy, so I was always kind of not fully clear what they were going for until I recently saw a video where somebody stacked the candy corns in a circle. Mm -hmm. They put arrange the candy corns in a circle and then stack them with the fat part facing out and the tips pointing in. And if you do that with a bunch of them, it actually does form an ear of corn. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, I think I saw that photo. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's like it's one of those things where you kind of suspected, but it. You weren't sure what was going on with the shape, but then it all makes sense when right. you see that. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, we can we can move on from the candy corn. Um, the thing that I think I wanted to talk about as well that's really important, we've talked a lot now about candy. Um, and we did talk about the drinks a bit, the pumpkin beer and the pumpkin spice latte, but we didn't really get to talk about Thanksgiving foods. Very which it's a very important, very large topic in the discussion of, you know, the fall season. Now, when you were a kid, before you did, I mean, you probably still helped in the kitchen, right? When you were cooking. Yeah, a little bit. I think my mom, you know, when I was a very small child, it was definitely my mom kind of cooking most of it by herself. Right. But yeah, I definitely helped a little. But as you've gotten older, has preparing certain foods... Uh, do you look forward to preparing certain foods since you're the one that's cooking? Definitely. Um, I definitely look forward to preparing the cranberry sauce, especially since we were always a canned cranberry sauce family growing up. And I was really into the canned cranberry sauce, though, and that was the thing where it was one of the jobs that as a little kid that I had was to slice the sauce. My mom would open the can and we'd put it on. She had, like, a special little silver dish. And then... It was one of, you know, the little kid safe jobs. You could get the butter knife out and slice, slice the cranberry sauce into the little um, round discs. And then, for some reason, my brother and I would always fight over who would get the end piece that had the can imprint. I'm really, I'm not sure why we thought that was, like, the most special piece. Did the edge part just supposed to taste better somehow? Or? I don't think it's supposed to taste better. It's just for some reason my brother and I thought that it was better maybe just we liked that it had more of the can design on it or what i don't know yeah, and good. yeah so i have so many fond memories of that but at the same time once i made my own cranberry sauce there's no going back yeah 
Fair so good. I yeah. mean, now it's like I loved cranberry sauce then, but now I don't even think I could go for the canned cranberry sauce just because the homemade cranberry sauce is so easy and so delicious. Do you want to give away our secret or no? I don't think it's a big enough secret that we have to, like, protect it. You know, I think we can tell people we like to make it with orange juice, and mm -hmm. that really adds, like, a nice zestiness to it that I think really yeah. really takes it to the next level. Cause the first, I think the first time I made it, I might have just used water, and that was fine. But once you do um, orange juice instead of water, that's where it really yeah. all starts happening. You don't think it makes it too sweet? I think that you should use less sugar, a little bit less sugar than the recipe calls for. Otherwise it does because the orange juice is adding in more sweetener. Fortunately, cranberries themselves are not actually very sweet almost at all. They're really a very tart right. thing. But yeah, I usually use a little less sugar. It's tricky because the recipe needs sugar in order to set up. But I have found that if you add a little bit of, um, I've used instant tapioca before, just a tiny bit. And because that's something that I sometimes keep in the cabinet anyway for thickening pies. If you use just a tiny bit of the instant tapioca, that can help to thicken it. If you're like cutting your sugar a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is delicious. Um, I also, I haven't yet figured out how to make a pumpkin pie as well as I want to, but pumpkin pie would definitely be one of my very favorite Thanksgiving foods. What part of the pumpkin pie is challenging to make? Well, and I've even had trouble even buying pumpkin pies that live up to my standards sometimes. Um, they shouldn't be too soft in the middle. I mean, it's a custard pie, so it's obviously going to be soft, but I like it to have set up a certain amount. Mm -hmm. Like, I like it just smooth and creamy, but not like too moist mm. and there shouldn't be any kind of a weird sponginess to the filling either mm. can you come back from being frozen as a pumpkin pie i think that you that can i mean i definitely remember one year we got a pumpkin pie from whole foods and i think it had previously been frozen and it was really good mm. and honestly for some reason natural food stores seem to make the best pumpkin pie because i've also gotten pumpkin pie from the independent natural food store down in Bloomington that was also really good. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what it is that they're doing differently. But when you try to make it yourself, is it the crust that's hard to do, or is it... Well, crust is a challenge. I mean, for any pie maker, crust is a huge challenge. But I've gotten my crust to the point where probably 75% of the time it comes out really well. So that's not really my problem. It's really just figuring out how to make the filling so it just sets up just right. So it's not too soft or too runny or just kind of weird in some way. Mm -hmm. um, roasting the turkey, of course, is an exciting part of, you know, the Thanksgiving meal. Mm -hmm. um, I know you asked about Halloween candy. What Halloween candy do you not like? So I think that's a good discussion for Thanksgiving because Thanksgiving is definitely one of those holidays where you're often mingling with other people. Mm -hmm. There's often you know, strange relatives bringing strange side dishes to the table, you know? I mean, of course you're getting great food from other people, but there's also the other side of that where you're getting some suspicious foods that you might not be eating normally. What's that one dish that people always do with, like, cream of mushroom soup and, like, green bean? Oh, like a green bean casserole? Yeah. I've never been much of a green bean casserole person. I, I don't even know how you make it, but I think it is pretty much just the green beans, the cream of mushroom soup. Usually there's those sort of crunchy onions on top. And uh, yeah, I, I like mean, those. well, who doesn't like a nice crunchy onion? But it's like the rest of that thing can just stay yeah. room. <laughs> I also don't like when people, and this is kind of a general thing, not just for Thanksgiving, but when people float things in jello. You mean like a jello mold or like a jello salad? Yeah. And I've definitely had some very suspicious holiday jellos, just, like, like a, like a green jello, but there's yeah. pieces of apples and carrots and also marshmallows in it. There's things like that that happen, and I'm like, and people make these specially for the holidays, because this is not something that I imagine people are making mm -hmm. during the rest of the year, no. but it's like, now is the time to do this. I would just prefer those things separately. You know, sure. I would have the fruit, I would have the jello, I wouldn't buy the two. That's just yeah. a personal preference, but... I can definitely understand that. What other ones don't you like? Other foods? Oh, let's see. I mean, I'm not really that into cloudy foods, so I'm pretty suspicious any time a casserole is involved, especially if it looks like someone was opening up any sort of cans of cream soup. So <laughs> even going beyond the casserole I mentioned, any sort of a casserole is usually kind of like something I'm going to pick around. Mm -hmm. um, I've had some interesting Thanksgivings as a child. I mean, 
See, my mom actually has said for years that she is the original inventor of the tofurkey. Which, I mean, as I'm sure people are aware of, is now a thing that you can buy at the store, the tofurkey. It's some kind of a tofu product with, like, a stuffing inside. Mm -hmm. And my mom did actually, when we were small, make a tofurkey. Mm -hmm. And this was before we'd ever seen the tofurkey in the store. So, I mean, perhaps she is the original inventor. Did she make it look like a turkey? Or? I think she kind of sculpted it a little bit. Yeah. You know, I think she tried to make, like, some drumsticks, and she definitely had kind of stuffing in the middle. Although, actually, here's the thing I want to talk about, is stuffing. Because mm -hmm. this is where I depart from most people. Mm -hmm. I love stuffing. Oh, mm -hmm. so good. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I do that's different, and this is something that my mom taught me, and it's interesting because there's a lot of cooking things that my mom has done over the years that I've kind of, as I've grown older, moved away from. But this is something that she taught me, so I always grew up thinking this was just the way to do it. And I realize now this is super weird because it seems like nobody else does it this way. But this is the way to do stuffing. Mm -hmm. Not only should you not stuff it inside the bird, but it should also be, like, a fairly crunchy thing. Like, basically when I make stuffing, it's kind of like a crouton, except with more butter. So it's a bit moister, but it's really just a seasoned bread. Like, a very seasoned, very buttered bread that's been toasted in the oven. And, of course, it's cubed, like, the way that you would do if you were cubing a bread stuffing. But the whole part where you're stuffing it in a bird and it's getting moist, like, just no. Now, do you put celery? I do. I do onions and celery and butter and spices. Mm. Mostly there's sage and black pepper, a little garlic. And then all of that gets kind of tossed with the bread. And then the bread gets roasted in the oven so that it gets a little crunchy on some bits. But then there's still kind of a chewy, buttery center to a lot of the pieces. And it's so good. And everybody that I've given this to has really liked it. And my sister was saying that she's fed this to some of her friends and kind of a friend's Thanksgiving that they've done. And they were all huge fans. Yeah, it's delicious. Now, um, I know there's a trend in the last few years of deep frying the turkey. Now, is that a trend in the last few years, though? Because I feel like that's always been, like, as long as always. I've been, al as long as I've been alive, I feel like I've heard people being like, oh, we're going to deep fry the turkey, and it's, like, exciting, and some people are horrified, and some people are, mm. like, really into it. Maybe it's not new, I don't know. It's definitely something that a lot of people are excited about right now. Yes. Um, I think it could be a good idea. I don't think I've ever had it that way. I can see how it would be delicious. But what I think would actually be more delicious, although, okay, look, before I go on to what would be more delicious, let's just note that I think the real thing that's keeping me from trying deep frying the turkey, other than that, you know, I don't want to buy a deep fryer and, like, however many gallons of oil you would need and all that. Yeah, industrial, yeah, so. I feel like so many people every year have, like, a fire. Oh, yeah. And it's just, it's a little too risky. I feel like every year at whatever paper I'm working at, I feel like we always have at least one, like, warning story about somebody that burned their garage down with the, you know. Because, I mean, it's basically just a, a giant boiling vat of hot, flammable oil that, like, you're precariously perching in the middle of your garage and then it spills and then, you know, the whole thing goes up. So, it's like... Yeah, I'm just, I'm a little too scared. I don't, you gotta be careful with that. I'm sure it would be delicious, though. I mean, I would definitely try it if I went to somebody's house and they were, like, worth the crime. I would be pretty excited to see what that's like. You don't think it's blasphemy for the Thanksgiving season to for deep fry? No, I think you should do whatever you want. You know what I think would be more delicious, though, and I have had this before, is to smoke it. Like, if you have a nice big smoker that you can fit the turkey in. Oh, yeah, smoked turkey's a thing, so... Yeah. I mean, really, let's be honest, though, any smoked meat is, like, amazingly delicious, so... But you don't believe... What, what about artificial smoke flavor? <laughs> I'm not so sure. I do have some liquid smoke liquid up in the smoke. cabinet. How I do they make the liquid smoke? I, never I don't it. know. And I've looked at the ingredients of the liquid smoke, and it just says liquid smoke. <laughs> so I have no idea. Like, are, do they make the smoke and add it to liquid? Is it something else entirely that just tastes like smoke? I have no idea. Is there, like, something, like, some compound that they make that is next to smoke and then retains the flavor of the smoke in the liquid? I don't that know. Be it? I don't know. It's, it's a mystery to me. It's a mystery to me, too. Um, another interesting Thanksgiving, as a kid, we had Thanksgiving with some friends, um, and, well, I think it was, a, there was a couple, and there were some kids, but I think half of the couple was a vegetarian, and, which is totally fine. I mean, I've had Thanksgiving with other vegetarians before, and it wasn't, like, a problem or anything, but this was a little bit awkward, because I think that they were a vegetarian who felt very passionately about just not just themselves, but anyone else eating meat. 
And so I'm not really clear on why we were having Thanksgiving with them since this was the case. But anyway, they sound so, like kind of a downer guest. To <laughs> well, no, it's to just, a, it would no, it would have been no, it would have been ah, fine because I it's. But it, but it doesn't have to be a meat based holiday. I mean, like I mentioned, my mom made the tofurkey yeah. before, and that was a year when we were having a vegetarian Thanksgiving. But this person like wept through the Thanksgiving dinner, like just sort of silently. Cause I think it was just too much for them to like see the bird on the table. Yeah. That was just too much for them. Sure. And I feel bad for them, but it's like in retrospect, that was like a really awkward Thanksgiving experience. Yeah. And I mean, it's just one of those things. I mean, Thanksgiving, like I said, like I said about there's a lot of foods coming to the table. There's also a lot of different people that can be coming to the table at Thanksgiving too. So, you bringing know, the, bringing their own issues. <laughs> <to> <laughs> 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 Um, <laughs> now you've also had an opportunity to with your with your family you know have different cultures takes on on the thanksgiving meal uh now you have italian relatives you know your your dad up through your grandma's side that that's the italian side yeah, so, so so how how does an italian thanksgiving traditionally from a, you know, American well, quote-unquote. I mean, I definitely wouldn't say I'm an expert on this because I no. haven't spent that many Thanksgivings with my Italian what are your side. But I definitely think Italian people tend to offer Italian side dishes with their regular stuff. So you might have, you know, your turkey and everything, but there might still be like a lasagna or, you know, some kind of a baked ziti or something on the side as well. Mm -hmm. um, I would say more as far as my personal experience of different cultures, I would say from my mom, because she's, you know, as a kid, she was the one who was cooking Thanksgiving dinner when we had Thanksgiving at home, which was kind of our usual thing. And she has more of an African-American background that she brings to the table. Um, the thing that she always liked to do for Thanksgiving, and I think this is definitely something that's common in the African-American community, more so than in other, you know, Americans at large, um, she would always make a sweet potato pie instead mm. of a thing, instead of a pumpkin pie mm -hmm. like, and that was very important to her like I think if I had to ask her like what's the most important dish for you to have at Thanksgiving just based on the evidence of how much you know emotion and importance she puts into that for her having the sweet potato pie that's the thing she remembers from when she was a child she remembers her grandmother making it and that's the thing that was very important for her to have mm -hmm. now aren't a lot of commercially bought Pumpkin pie is actually something else, too. I think sometimes they might be butternut squash. Yeah. As far as you're talking about the commercial, like the pumpkin filling material that yeah, you I'm use talking to make a, pie. Yeah, I'm talking about I think sometimes they might be butternut squash rather than being actual pumpkin because mm -hmm. you'll notice if you cook an actual pumpkin down, mm -hmm. the pl flesh is fairly pale. Mm -hmm. Whereas I feel like, and it, it has a milder flavor than some of the canned pumpkin that you'll buy even if it doesn't have any other ingredients. So it's not like this has been, you know, flavored or colored somehow. It will be oranger and it will have a, kind of a little bit of a stronger flavor. And I think that might be because it's really some kind of a squash. Mm -hmm. Like another, I mean, a pumpkin is a kind of squash, but another kind of squash, maybe it's not mm -hmm. strictly a pumpkin that's going on there. No, we tried to, well, we did make a pumpkin pie with a whole pumpkin we bought once, right? Yeah, and that was, that was, you know, one of the pumpkin pies I was referring to when I said that so far it hasn't gone so well for me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's... Was it because we used a whole pumpkin and, and it was just, we should have used the can, maybe? I mean, I think there's definitely a way to use a whole pumpkin and have it come out right. I think it came out too watery when we did that. And I think our mistake was that I think when we cooked our pumpkin, I think we may have steamed it or something. Mm. If I was going to do that again, which I would like to try again, you know, sometime in the next couple of years, mm. I would probably roast the pumpkin. Because that would more, I think steaming it, you're adding extra water and you're diluting the flavor a little bit. Whereas if we roasted it, I think that would intensify the flavor and it would eliminate some of the extra water and I think we'd probably have better results. Yeah, you're probably right. Uh, anything else about the Thanksgiving meal we didn't cover? I feel like there's so much to say about the Thanksgiving meal. I mean, do you have any other, other questions for me? <laughs> uh, well, what are, your fa what are your, some of your other favorite sides that we haven't mentioned yet that you look forward to? I usually like to have something that's a little bit, because I feel like everything we've mentioned is like a sweet stuff, and I usually like to have something a little bit more on the tart or acidic side. Mm -hmm. I feel like that really adds good balance to the meal. For a long time, I, it was potato salad, no. and that was another thing that came from my mom, was a potato salad. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of switched more to pasta salad in recent years. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but something with like a nice vinegar base, and I don't mess with any sort of like a mayonnaise. I'm, I'm talking like a vinegar, oil, mustard, like more of a German potato salad or like a nice clear, kind of a Greek type of pasta salad. And yeah, for people that don't know, you might have figured out that Ash has a blanket anti-cloudy food and drink policy. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't say it's a blanket policy though, because there are, there are exceptions. Like, I'm a big fan of Greek yogurt. You like ice cream? I do like ice cream. Um, How is it yet? I like coconut milk. Uh-huh. But yes, I, mean, I have a suspicion, definitely suspicion and hesitation when it comes to cloudy foods. Is that because most of them are like egg-based or... Most of them are egg-based, which slightly creeps me out. I, I had chickens for a long time, <laughs> and chickens are really dirty birds. Mm -hmm. So just eggs freak me out. I definitely eat eggs cooked yeah. into things, mm -hmm. but I like them to be fully disguised so I can't taste any of the egg flavor. Mm -hmm. And I also like them to be fully cooked. Like anything where the egg is still of a runny consistency makes me feel really, really scared. Yeah. And I'm also, I think... I'm a little bit lactose intolerant, and that's probably part of why my, I don't like cloudy foods, because a lot of them contain milk and things like that, so a lot of them do make me sick if I eat a lot of them. Even the ones I like, like ice cream, I try not to eat very often, mm -hmm. because I'm not going to feel well if I eat a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Yogurt, though, um, is something that a lot of lactose intolerant people can digest pretty well, and that's maybe part of the reason that I like it, mm -hmm. is that not only is it really good for you, but it's also, you know, it's not making me ill like some other foods. <laughs> uh, one Thanksgiving food we haven't talked about that I always look forward to is, and I could have this any time of year it's not like this only comes out during the Thanksgiving season but it's the crescent rolls yes and I've sort of grown to be fond of those over the years since I've been with you because that's always been your thing like I think the first Thanksgiving that I was ever having with you I remember you saying like I'm so excited for the crescent rolls and so I always look forward to every year having those and I would actually really like to learn how to make them though because we always, you know, do the, just the, the beat and pop, or however you call it when you, you know, you beat the can against something and then it kind of pops open. Beat and pop, I think. I don't know, works. that's somehow that doesn't sound right. I don't know, that's right. the Indian. Smash and pop? Smash and pop? I don't know. That, I don't think that sounds right either. Anyway. Is this a I term think, you've heard? No, you know? I just, I feel like there's a name for the type oh. of can where, you know, the contents are sort of pressurized, mm -hmm. you hit it against the countertop and it kind of springs open a little bit. Yeah. Anyway, everyone knows what we're talking about. <laughs> Yes, they um, do. But yes, those are those are good. It doesn't seem like it would be that complicated to make. I think we could probably figure it out. It really wouldn't be. It would just be hard for me to make them be exactly like the ones that you like. Because I feel like you have you you like those so much that it would be very hard to replicate them yeah. exactly enough so that you would like them as well. And I don't want to make them and have you be like sad because you're not <laughs> getting the rolls you want. You know? Fair enough. Now, uh, one thing we haven't talked about with the turkey is the great white meat, dark meat debate. A very important debate. Yeah. Where, where do you where do you come down? I've come over to the white meat side. Blasphemy. And and it's funny, I think my tastes have changed because I did like dark meat better before. And then the last couple of years I finally just realized I actually really just like the white meat. But doesn't it taste a little dry to you sometimes, like the white meat? Only if the turkey's been cooked incorrectly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think it's dry. I mean it's milder. I think the dark meat has a more intense flavor and it has more fat, so it's more flavorful. Mm -hmm. And those are generally things that do make something taste better, mm -hmm. but there's something about the intensity of the dark meat that I've kind of gotten over. Hmm. And I also do feel like, you know, and I'm somebody that would probably even put myself on the dark meat side still, um, even though I have come around a little bit on the white meat. I mean, it's all good. It's all turkey. Thanksgiving is fine. <laughs> but... Um, I feel like some of the lower quality meat is in the dark meat category. You know, your parts that you find towards the bottom of the turkey. and That's definitely true. There was, I mean, because everyone's like the breast, you know, that's yeah, like a nice big that's, that's, white that's meat. That's your white meat central. The yeah. dark meat is generally coming from, you the know, kind of, yeah, <laughs> sure. places you wouldn't normally go for first. But I think it's still good to eat that. I mean, if you're going to oh, roast yeah. an entire animal, mm -hmm. you should, uh, you at least owe it to the animal to eat as much of the meat as you can, I think. Yeah. Now, one thing that <laughs> didn't work out so well when you were pregnant uh -huh. was, uh, we tried to make, uh, or I tried to make soup. Well, it wasn't <laughs> just the Okay. It wasn't just the soup. When I was pregnant, <laughs> But it's a common thing. Yes. Well, I, well, it's a common thing for people to have aversions to certain foods. And when I was pregnant, I had an intense aversion to poultry. 
Like it start. I started, you know, noticing it just with chicken because I had I had for years not eaten much chicken, and then I had started eating chicken again. And then when I was pregnant, I remember I bought some chicken, mm -hmm. and I think that chicken actually went bad in our fridge because I couldn't <laughs> even bring myself to cook it because just just thinking about cooking it. Uh -huh was just like that was like too much for me like there yeah. was no way I, I couldn't even cook it just for you to eat it it was just like it was just just the thought of it just imagining how it was going to smell was too much for me <laughs> so i mean after that though i just didn't buy any more chicken and that's fine but then the thanksgiving season rolled around and of course this was a little bit early into my pregnancy mm -hmm. so we weren't really ready to tell people yet mm -hmm. so that was a little bit of a challenge because First of all, we were seeing all these friends and family, you know, over the Thanksgiving holiday, and it's hard to hide your pregnancy, you know, because we were excited about it, of course, and of course, you know, there's lots of alcoholic beverages being offered at the Thanksgiving table, and people wonder why you're not drinking, so I mean, there's that, so, and of course, I'm sure I was, like, worrying about people noticing I wasn't drinking more than anyone else was noticing, I mean, who knows, but anyway, so, it was already like, you know, we're trying to hide this pregnancy, but like all the stuff mm -hmm. is happening that, you know, make it a little more difficult. And then, of course, just the smell of the cooking turkey. Mm -hmm. So bad. And I was really sad about it because I normally really look forward to that smell of the roasting turkey and I really enjoy it. And just, I felt so nauseous, like, all through Thanksgiving dinner. Like, I was just kind of, like, sipping my water and just, like, trying to just get through the meal without, mm -hmm. like, turning green. And then we did try to make soup. And, well, not we tried to make soup. You really wanted to make soup. Because that's always something that I think you like to do. I love, like to, make I love soup. to do that. It's great. And see, I like to make the soup, too, but I just think you're doing it wrong. Which, <laughs> I mean, that sounds bad. No, that sounds bad. It's just, I think that you can't just boil the whole carcass and then think you're just going to, like, throw your vegetables in there and it becomes soup. You really need to make the broth separately. Like, you need to boil the bones and whatever meat you're not planning on using. You need to do those separately, strain that out, make that into the broth, and then separately add in the vegetables and, like, the meat that you're actually going to eat. Right. <laughs> and that's something that I'm definitely hoping to do this year. Oh, yeah. What great just think about it. Yeah. But you also like to keep the uh, rice or pasta or whatever kind of starch that you're including with the soup separate until you're ready to eat it. Oh, you mean like if I was making like a turkey noodle soup or something? Yeah. Yes, because I don't like when the noodles get all weird and soft and start kind of melting into the broth, especially since we're a pretty small family size, so usually I'll make more soup than we can eat just in one sitting. Mm -hmm. So I like to be able to reheat the soup, you know, a number of times and then just add the pasta in each time. Yeah. I feel like that's that's really the way to do it. Yeah. We're giving away all your secrets here on this podcast. I don't know if that's exactly a secret. <laughs> I mean, it, was I, a secret. it was something other, I didn't know. <laughs> other people are welcome to do that. Do that if they would like. Um, what other Thanksgiving foods have we not talked about? I feel like there's got to be some big ones that we're missing. Oh, here's a question I have for you. Yeah. How do you feel when there's, like, an alternate meat on the Thanksgiving table? Like, mm. I know some people will also have, like, a ham. Mm. Now, do you think it's okay, or do you think that's, like, it should be, like, strictly the turkey? Well, I mean, I can't say I would turn down a slice of ham if it was there, but, you know, if I was making it myself, I wouldn't think, oh, no, it's not complete unless I have the ham, too. It's, like, I think that maybe, I think when I've encountered a ham, it's usually in a setting where a lot of people are being fed at once, sure. and either... It's not usually the case that the turkey wouldn't feed the whole party because it seems like there's always not a lot of everybody covers, likes no matter, turkey. You want to have you want to yeah, have more options. The more turkey. people there are, you know, it is it is a holiday meat. I mean, isn't yeah. that the traditional Christmas? I think dinner? it's often traditional Christmas. But we've also we've done a goose, I believe, for Thanksgiving before, mm -hmm. and that was really good. That was good. Yeah. Well, did we do duck for Christmas or Thanksgiving? I think we've done a duck for Christmas. We've done a goose for both of those. We've done a ham for Christmas more often. I Something that started with a C that we did once. We didn't do it. We thought about it. We oh, thought nice. about... We considered... I think when we were looking for a goose and couldn't find one, we saw something called a capon. Mm. We were wondering what it was. And I think we finally figured out that it's like a rooster that's been neutered or something. I don't think we ended up actually cooking yeah. that. No. We're just <laughs> more like, hey, this is an option. <laughs> but I'm okay with mixing and matching. You know, if, if it was like I went and there was a ham instead of a turkey... Then you'd be upset. No turkey at all... So you want some kind of a large bird on your table. 
Yeah. What about a small bird? Like, what if it was just, like, individual quails? Would you be okay with that? Like, each person gets their own quail? Sure. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, it would kind of be a weird situation, but, yeah, you know, mostly because I don't know how to eat those tiny birds. Exactly. Am I supposed <laughs> I'm sure to you use can my it fork? Out. Am I supposed to just grab just the whole thing and pick the tiny shove it in my face? Between your fingers? Yeah, exactly. It doesn't yeah. seem like you eat it like a normal bird. Maybe you do. I don't know. I've never really encountered one yeah. <laughs> in the wild. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Um, well, I don't know if you're running out of time. Because, um, yeah, I mean, there's more to say about Thanksgiving, I feel, but also we want to talk a little bit about the fashions of the fall, because that's a very important aspect that we well, haven't really discussed. Let's go ahead and finish up the Thanksgiving food part. Anything else about Thanksgiving? Okay. Um, I know some people that do a soup thing. Like, my friend Marissa always does a thing with her kind of extended family. I think it might be the day after Thanksgiving. They all gather, and there's a big soup thing. Like, each person or each family brings a soup, and then they all eat soup together. Mm. And that always sounded nice to me, like a nice tradition. And I do know a lot of people will include some kind of a soup on the Thanksgiving table. Like, my family, when I was very young, like, back when my, you know, original set of parents were married, um would always have a clam chowder mm. on the Thanksgiving and the Christmas table, kind of as, a, like, a soup addition to the thing. And I don't know if that is a traditional thing. Like, I don't know if that was from my mom or from my dad, that they had carried that over from their families, or if it was just some kind of a weird thing that they just did one year and then just decided to keep doing. You know what I mean? When you're a little kid, something happens every holiday. You just assume this is just how things are done. And then later you're like, where did that tradition come from? I don't know. I don't know. Right. <laughs> uh, of course, there's always the tradition of breaking the wishbone from the turkey. Mm, yes. You have to make sure it's dried out first, right? You can't do it when it's wet or it won't work, right? Yeah, I think we would always kind of dry ours for like a week or something and then do it. Now, do you just like pull or can you yank or how, how does it work? The way we always did it in my family, it would always be me and my brother, uh -huh. and each one of us would be holding on to one of the prongs, and then you count to three, and you kind of pull apart, and uh -huh. whoever gets the, kind of, I guess, apart and kind of downwards. Is there a way to cheat at this? I mean, I always felt like my brother was cheating, but I think that's probably just because, you know, as the younger sibling, you have the older, stronger sibling, they're yeah. usually, not only are they probably stronger, so maybe more able to pull the thing in their favor, but also probably a little smarter when you're very young, so maybe able to identify which side is going to go their way better, you know, <laughs> but I don't know for sure <laughs> if there's really a way to cheat on that. Three sold out on that one. Yeah. Have you ever had it where it splits right down the middle? I feel like that happened a lot, and it's always, like, a kind of a big disappointment. Yeah, it's like one of us uh, has to win. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, someone has to make a wish, otherwise I think no one gets to make a wish, right? Oh, I thought you both did. Oh, well, that's a much nicer way of thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a little more winner-take-all the way you're talking. Yeah. Anything else about Thanksgiving? Um, nothing else is coming to mind right now. Is there anything that you think we no, left to talk we, about? No, I think we did it, I think, for Thanksgiving. Of course, when we finish, we're probably going to think of five other things we didn't yeah. talk about. But. I mean, I will add that there's lots of great Thanksgiving TV to be watched, but not so much Thanksgiving uh, movies. Yeah, we kind of talked about this after the last podcast, how it's like all the Thanksgiving movies are kind of just like sad, oh, I'm going home for the holidays, weird family's going to be there, or it's hard to get home, travel difficulties. <laughs> yeah, or you're going home and you're like, wanting to have a certain image of, like, success and, like, you've cleaned your act up, but, like, will people think this or not? Yeah, yeah, Thanksgiving movies do tend to be a little more somber than, like, Halloween or Christmas movies. Um, yeah. Planes, Trains, and Automobiles is, I think, probably, if I had to go with, like, the most classic Thanksgiving movie. Yeah. That's a, that's a good one. Yeah, that definitely is a good one. Uh, Pieces of April is also pretty good. It's been a few years since I've seen that. Those are also the only two I can think of off the top of my head. I can think of another one called something vaguely like Home for the Holidays or something. I'm sure you're not just making that up? No, I'm not. I'm not. This is a real film. Home for the Holidays. I think it's a real movie. An Ash Co. production. Um, there are a lot of movies that sort of span the holiday season mm. that will include Thanksgiving and Christmas, but I feel like I often end up thinking of a lot of those as Christmas movies. Sure. Like, um, there's a lot of Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan movies. Like, um, You've Got Mail, there's a Thanksgiving scene, mm. and then there's, you know, a Christmas scene. They kind of go through the whole winter holiday season. Mm -hmm. um, also, that Sleepless in Seattle there's Thanksgiving, and then, you know, we move on to Christmas with that one as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, but yes, yeah, so let's move on to the fashions of the fall. All right. 
one of the things that gets me most excited about the fall is just the, the clothes that you can wear. Go for it. Um, I guess we should start from the ground up and talk about boots. I think it was right around the time that I was going to college that Ugg boots really became a thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like a big thing, obviously, you think of boots. But right now, the thing that I think is really happening that I'm really excited about, and I really want to get a pair of these, are the Hunter, like, Welly boots. Mm -hmm. Like, so good. Um, like the ones that Harper has, right? Yes, yes, our son has um, a pair that was... One of the things that I was so excited to get for him, like, even before he was born, just, you know, looking on Pinterest, like, the cutest photos of, like, the cutest little toddlers in their little boots, and I had to wait forever for his feet to be big enough. I actually bought them before they were even the right size. Like, I bought the smallest size available, and then I had to wait for, like, half a year for him to, like, finally be able to get into them. But he's wearing them, you know, this season. It's all happening, and I'm so excited about it. I mean... So many, just the cutest fall, but the great thing about them is that they can go fall and they can kind of go through the winter and the springtime, but just the cutest fall photos of the boots on like a little kid, you know, you're apple picking, you're wearing the boots. And my real fond dream is that I will get a matching pair so we can do like a mother-son photo shoot wearing the boots. Mm -hmm. You're welcome to join us, but I know you won't. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I appreciate it. I've invited you to all of my family shoe matching ideas, and you just decline, decline every every time. You and I did have matching Converse at one point in time. Not matching; they were different colors, but we both simultaneously owned Converse and sometimes wore them at the same time. That's yeah. about as matching as I've been able to get you. You know. But yes, me and him totally with the matching hunter boots mm -hmm. just m would make all my dreams come true. Yes. Um, the other kind of boots that I'm really excited about, but more in a way where it's like, I'll probably never be buying you because they cost like a million dollars, are fry boots, which is just like a real classic leather boot. Mm -hmm. Like just like, and of course there's all different styles, you know, you can do cowboy boots, you can do, you know, motorcycle boot, all that. But anyway, boots, a great great fashion item that you can really pull out of the closet when the fall comes because i mean the summer it's really too hot for boots of any kind so mm -hmm. it's like really exciting when the fall weather comes and you can finally put those on um of course jeans or leggings you know there's i don't really have much to say about like fall like leg wear mm. other than that there's lots of leggings that are super popular right now it seems like lots of patterned leggings but that's a thing that seems to be happening for every season i don't really think that's a fall thing mm -hmm. Um, but sweaters mm -hmm. and jackets of all different kinds. Mm -hmm. So excited to pull those out. For years, I was super into the hooded sweatshirt. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would always be super excited when I could, you know, put on my boots and my hooded sweatshirt. And I would be like, you know, this is real fall living. You're walking down the sidewalk. Your boots are crunching the leaves. You've got your hooded sweatshirt around you. I've moved on a little bit. I'm not saying that I don't like hooded sweatshirts anymore, but I've definitely kind of come over to the side of sweaters more in recent years. So I'm super excited to be able to pull my sweaters out. The only time I've been able to wear a sweater recently is when we're shopping at Target because they keep it so cold in there. But... That might be another podcast. Why? <laughs> yes. Rob Burgess Show podcast investigation. Why are the Target stores so cold? <laughs> yes, but other than that, I'm pretty excited to be able to finally wear my sweaters again now that fall's come. And scarves, too, because I was a knitter for years. I mean, I wouldn't say I'm not a knitter anymore so much as just I haven't really found a way to work knitting into my lifestyle with a young child, but mm -hmm. very excited to wear scarves this year as well. Mm -hmm. Um. I've tried to get you to wear a scarf before, and you've been pretty, you know, not so into it. But I think it's definitely a unisex item. Yeah. But it's like we say with him, it's like we have a son named Harper with long hair, and sometimes we dress him in pink shorts. It's like we kind of need to maybe curve a little bit more <laughs> towards the masculine side. Not that there's anything wrong with the way he looks or that people mistake him but for But I'm girl, saying but... for you, I mean, no one's ever mistaken you for being woven as far as I know, well. so... <laughs> Over the phone sometimes, I guess. Like, Bam. I'm saying you could you could wear a scarf if you wanted. Yeah, probably. You don't have to, but you could. Um. But yeah, it's just it's a great season for clothes. So. But I think you in general like the idea of being having it be cold on the outside and you bundle up. Well, yeah, warm. I do think. I do think it's a it's a difference as far as what temperatures you favor. I think you want it to be so warm that you don't even like need any clothes. Mm -hmm. Whereas I want it to be just cool enough 
that I can feel perfectly comfortable in just like a nice, like a sweatshirt and like a scarf. And then I feel just wonderful. Mm -hmm. If it's like just cold enough that without those, I'd be too cold. But with them, I feel just perfect. And that's when I feel like excited and invigorated. And I want to get outside and do stuff. Yeah. I can see that. And plaid, I guess, would be the other thing to mention for the fall. Because that's something that's definitely become more trendy. I mean, plaid is always around. Mm -hmm. And it kind of comes in and out. But I think buffalo plaid has been super popular the last couple years. Like, I definitely, like, in the last couple years, suddenly started noticing that it was, like, a thing. Because it's, like, always around. Mm -hmm. But then lately, it's just, like, all over. Right. Now, buffalo plaid is the... It's the plaid where it's kind of, like, a dark, like, a totally filled-in square... And then, you know, it's a plaid pattern, but it's, like, more of, like, a bold squares type of thing. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think the most traditional way you would see that would be, like, red and either black or very dark blue. But I've also seen it with more of, like, a white and kind of a black type of look. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I think that's definitely, like, a thing now. It's, like, very happening for the fall. Yeah, you're right. What other fall fashions have we not talked about yet? I think that might be hitting on most of it. I mean, I'm excited for hats. I mean, as as a parent, I'm excited for the cute hats that I can get for our, our son. Like, little knitted hats with bear ears and things like that. I will say that there's a real lack of Thanksgiving fashion available. I mean, for Thanksgiving, I'll probably just dress him in some kind of, like, you know, just, like, probably, like, a buffalo plaid shirt or something like that. Maybe, like, some flannel, maybe some corduroy pants. But there's so much available for Halloween and for Christmas, not just to wear on the day, but also just, like, leading up to the day. There's, like, cute pajamas and sweatshirts and T-shirts and little costumes, little outfits, all kinds of, you know, headbands and sunglasses and just socks, anything you could think of. Mm -hmm. And there's really just not a lot when it comes to Thanksgiving. So right. I would like to find some cute Thanksgiving clothes for him. I mean, I think as an adult, you pretty much just kind of wear something sort of nice, you know, a sweater, mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, Thanksgiving, like we were talking about with the movies, it's like a little more toned down, a little more somber in that way. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a pilgrim costume. Or, or if we want to get really political, maybe like a Indian costume, right? You know, but yeah, I mean, we don't, we don't I don't know if we want to go there. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, is there anything else we didn't talk about that? I think that hits, you know, some of the major major things. Is there anything that you can think of that? No, we I think cover? we covered it. I All mean, right, we'll probably have to do another one before the season's over. I bet because I don't. I think I have a sneaking suspicion there will be something else that. You're gonna... Just a huge omission that we <laughs> need to correct. Even if, if not for that, I think we're going to have to come back in like a month or two and talk about the Christmas season. Oh, because... yeah. Oh, well, the one thing that we should mention, which I think this really kind of is verging into the Christmas season, but we should definitely touch on the whole day after Thanksgiving sales type mm. of thing. Because that's definitely still part of fall. It's really attached to Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Although I think that's kind of more of going into the Christmas well, season. Well, that's the official start of the Christmas season. The shopping season, at least. I still feel like that is so tied to Thanksgiving that it deserves a mention here. Yeah. Um, especially because, and we don't really like to go out for those anymore, mm -hmm. but I definitely remember a long time ago when we had gone out, there were some people that I think started camping on Thanksgiving. Yeah. So it's like you're sacrificing the Thanksgiving at home with your family to go to these sales, and some people even were, like, having Thanksgiving dinner, like, in their, like, you know, folding chairs and stuff. And to me, yeah. that's just, like, very, very sad. Well, it's only gotten worse since I started, because, I mean, I started going when I was in college, which was about 10 years ago or so. And at that point, it was, like, actually the day after Thanksgiving was when it happened. You'd get up super early and get in line, and those stores would open at 6 a.m. or whatever. Now, it's... I think some short stores are starting as early as 5 or 6 p.m. on thanksgiving day so right in the middle of when you would be going to thanksgiving dinner now it's you're out shopping or i mean if you want to get in line you're going to be there all thanksgiving and that's just i mean that's too much to me i mean i grew up in a family that where we kind of mocked people that would go to those sales and then the first time i ever went was actually with you and it was super fun i remember the first time we went i, I felt like you know we weren't really there for anything like any big ticket items 
So we weren't like, I need this TV or anything. We were just there to buy like DVDs and stuff like that. And there was kind of a, just a general fun atmosphere. I felt like from the other shoppers, like people were just kind of like, oh, this is exciting. We're all here. And then just within a few years, you know, as the recession hit, I definitely saw that kind of take a dark turn. And it's like, this is not fun anymore. Like, I don't want to risk my life to like go to these sales. And I don't want to go to a sale that starts when I'd rather be at home with my family having Thanksgiving, Mm -hmm. you know, and just no. Yeah. Next thing you know, you're getting pepper sprayed for some Xboxes. Yeah, or like crushed to death crushed on the way death. in. And, yeah. You know, so yeah, not, not exactly. so into that. Exactly. Well, thank you for being a guest on the Rob Burgess Show again, Ash Burgess. Uh, you're welcome back anytime. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I, I definitely will be back, I, I suspect. <laughs> <laughs> I know where to find you. <laughs>